God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things, down a little bit, Zane, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So that, that's where we started last week, and um, we talked about a few things about, you know, here we are confronted with three terrible realities. They have complete inner knowledge from God that their ways deserves and must have divine condemnation and judgment. Now, who is this talking about? Let's establish this first. It's talking about us? Is it talking about us? As believers, is it talking about us? It's talking about the non-believer. And, and see, this is, this, is, this is where when you read the Bible, you have to be sure that you know who the audience is, who it's being written to. Because you may get caught up in some of these things, backbiter, right, proud, bolster, disobedient to parents. You might get caught up in this category, right? But it's talking to the non-believer and not necessarily talking to the believer. Because even though we go through some of these things, and we do have inner knowledge from God that these things are wrong. The one thing that we do miss is divine condemnation. Condemnation is death. We have inherited eternal life. So you have to make sure you know the audience, because if you don't know the audience, you'll couple yourself in with something like this, and, and it doesn't, you don't even belong in it in the first place. Uh, so then we went on to talk about, you know, Romans chapter 2. Oh, no, 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 that's, that's, that's to know. To become thoroughly acquainted with, to know thoroughly, to know accurately, to know well, to know, to recognize, by sight and hearing of certain signs, to perceive who a person is, to know, to perceive, to know, to find out, to ascertain, to know, to understand. So when, when, when it was talking about they know, look, 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 look. verse 32, it said, um, who knowing the judgment of God, they were, they were, they were certain. They were certain, right? The reason why they were certain that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Come on, come on, come with me. 
that type thing, right? That was me. I was chief center, champion, was a Pied Piper. What else you want to call me? I was all that. Deep, what you laughing? You was too? Oh, read that. <laughs> read that. So then we go into 2 Romans chapter 1, I mean chapter 2, right? And it says, uh, Therefore thou art inexcusable, old man, whosoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemn thyself. For thou that judgest do the same things. Now, who's this talking to? This one's talking to us. Okay. Why? Why is this talking to us? Now, so, so why did the audience change? Because a different chapter? Okay, we went from 32 to verse 1. What's that mean? So, that, so has, the audience, has the audience changed? Yes, absolutely. Whoa, 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 whoa. It hasn't, right? Therefore, means, therefore it, it gave the statement in 32, well, 28 to 32. So then, therefore, thou art an excusable old man, who, whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemn thyself. Now, check this out. We, I heard a couple of people say we're not supposed to judge, right? The Bible says, judge not, lest she be judged, right? The Bible also says, how can you pull the speck out of your brother's eye when you have the beam in your own eye? What's the rest of the scripture say, though? The rest of that scripture says, first, go get your speck out, then come back and judge, get the beam out, then come back and judge the speck that's in his eye. So does that tell us not to judge? It just tells us to get right first. Okay, what about the scripture where Paul says the, the boy in Corinthians who was having, having sex with his mom, his, his, father's, his father's wife? I don't know if it was a stepmom or his mom, right? It never states whether it's a stepmom or his mom. But Paul says, get him out of there because I've judged him as if I was already there. Paul wrote the letter and said, listen, I'm sending a letter, get him out of there. Okay? Okay, so, so let me ask you a question. If you call on me and ask my opinion of something, <laughs> what are you asking me for? My judgment on the matter. But see, we equate judging as something that's uncomfortable. So the moment that it's uncomfortable, only God can judge me. Don't judge me. Ain't you supposed to be a Christian? The Bible says don't judge me. I said, well, well, when you're calling me and asking me to pray or asking me for my counsel, then you're asking me for my judgment. So I don't deal with that. Judgment starts in the house of the Lord. On all ends. It starts here. Not guilty. The rest of the people who have to line up later. So, so don't get caught in the trick bag of not understanding scripture and let people put you in a place because how can you pull a person out of darkness into light if you don't reprove them? Reproving means to expose uh, the wickedness. So how can you expose the wickedness without a conversation? Because see, they're, they're, let me tell you, the world's reply is, don't judge me. And we fell up in that. Y'all run around back in the day talking, singing Tupac, only God can judge me. Got caught up in it. But we 
we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. So when we, when we pass judgment, if we pass biblical judgment, are we judging them or is the word of God judging them? The word judges them. So when they, when a person tells you, "Don't judge me," I ain't judging you. Yeah, the word, just, the word's judging you already. And think about this, old man, that judges them which do such things, and do us not the same. That thou shalt escape the judgment of God. See, see, you gotta understand who this audience is, because if you do not understand who this audience is. You are going to read this wrong. You're going to read the whole book wrong. You're going to read the whole book wrong. Um, when you get to Romans 8, and he says, therefore there is no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8.1. That's a general statement. That is a broad general statement. Therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So, it automatically puts in my mind a compare and contrast. Okay, so, let's just run the gamut. Who's outside of Christ? Come on. Huh? Non-believers, sinners. Okay, that's a general statement. Let's make it. Let's make it personal. Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, all that. Right. So, if you know that you escaped, look, look, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and do the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Where is the safety from the judgment of God? In Christ. So if the safety is there, is this talking to you? See, that's the first thing. See, that's how you read the word. Because if you read the word too fast and don't think about it, you'll place yourself in judgment. The escape of wrath, the escape of God's wrath is only in Christ. It is the... Uh, 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 we say it wrong. You know the thing they throw out the little circle thing off the boat and you know, the water drowns? What's it called? Yeah. <coughs> no, not that. No, the thing you put on. Yeah, uh, life saver. Life preserver. I always say life saver. <laughs> you know the candy. Preserve. Yeah, preserver. Life preserver. That's what it is. Life savers. Yeah, green, red, yellow, orange. Okay, so let's dig into this thing. Verse 3. Let's dig into this. Okay, 
Now we backpedaling, convince what else? Minor league, not unless. Let's start there. First thing, the judgment of God is according to truth. Every man is naturally blind to his own state and sins. Okay, before Jesus, before any knowledge of God. Because some of us, some of us um, grew up here, and some of us didn't. I didn't. So when I'm running around doing whatever I'm doing from the time that I was able to realize what was right and wrong, okay, when I was five, climbing, climbing up on the table, taking the butter dish and eating a whole stick of butter, knowing they yelled at me the last time, right? But I wanted butter at five, okay? Y'all, yeah, yeah, I'd eat the whole stick. It'd be summertime. It'd be melted a little bit. Yeah. I'd be in there. My parents, you wasn't I wasn't mighty convinced. No. The belt didn't even do nothing. I was naturally blind to my own state and sense. Okay, so so this is this is this is key. This is key. State. The word state. What does that imply? Disposition. Break down disposition for those who don't understand what disposition means. You do know, because you said it. Mindset? No, 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 no. Huh? Being? Okay, so, 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 okay, let me give it to you, scripture. We were born into and shaped into, is the iniquity the state? What's the state? Born into. Okay, so so if I'm born into sin, what I start lusting after begins to shape, right? Born into sin, shaping into iniquity, right? So I'm born into sin, I'm born into a state of sin. Not until I become born again do I live in a state of righteousness. Not unless mightily convinced by the Holy Ghost. The convincing is the drawing that the Holy Ghost draws us. Some of us hear Holy Ghost immediately and say, Psh, I'm going with him. Other of us have to be broken in, in, in order to get into this convincing, right? Okay, okay. All right. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourselves that you escape? You're still confused. You're still confused. I know I read these scriptures. You're still saying, but it's saying, it's saying, it's talking to me. Do you, who feels that way? Feel, you feel like it's talking to me. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do themselves that you will escape the judgment of God. See, listen, the last part of that, the last part of that, that you will escape the judgment of God. See, the last part of that. See, this is where religion has to go out the door and you start knowing theology. You have to realize who you are in Christ Jesus. Because if you do not know who you are in Christ Jesus, you will put yourself in condemnation. You will put yourself in guilt. You will put yourself in shame when you don't even belong there. And you'll live in guilt. You'll live in shame. You'll live in condemnation. Living in the wrong state. You'll be in the state of righteousness thinking, thinking, because you're, because because your theology is wrong. Thinking that you live it in sin. The second you is emphatic. Do you suppose that you of all men will escape? The objector, doubtless, did suppose this, 
and not without reason, for the visible handing over to a reprobate mind and behavior, which was the token of God's wrath upon Gentile sinners, did not apply to him. He was rather the object of God's kindness, but this was a privilege he had misinterpreted. He is now being, he is now to be enlightened. Now, check this out. For the visible handling over to the reprobate mind and behavior, these verses in chapter 1, right? Which was the token of God's wrath upon Gentile sinners. So if this is being stated here, at this time of living, in biblical days, who else could they be talking to? There was only two. Who? Jews and the Gentiles. So, look, listen to this. The second you is emphatic. Do you suppose that you of all men will escape? The objector doubtless did suppose this. The objector, the Jew. And not without reason. For the visible handing over to reprobate mind and behavior, which was the token of God's wrath upon Gentile sinners, did not apply to him. So, the reprobate mind that was given, okay, okay, I'll make it easy for you. Romans 1.24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up until foul, foul, foul affections. For even their woman did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves that recompense of their error which was met. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So God is looking at the Gentile and saying, you who are practicing these things, right, I've given you over to a reprobate mind. Oh, man, listen, listen. Check this out. He then says, you Jews, who think, let's look at 32, look at 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, okay, okay, check this out. This is good. 32 says, who knowing the judgment of God, did the Gentile sinner who worshiped the moon, the star, the, did he know the judgment of God? Who knew the judgment of God? The Jew, okay. So who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them to do them. So there were some Jews that were doing what Gentiles were doing. Right? Okay, okay. So I, I just want to, because, because I'm trying to clear up and I'm trying to put the puzzle together for you because these first few chapters are important when we get to the back of the book. When we get to the back of Romans, this stuff is important. He was, he was rather the object of God's kindness, but this privilege, this was a privilege he misinterpreted. Okay, so why was he uh, 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 um, an object of God's kindness? Okay, now, who's the audience? Huh? Nobody's answering me with, with straight conviction that they know what they're talking about. Everybody's a answering me with... Everyone. Who's the audience? Jews. Jews. He was rather the object of God's kindness. Why was the Jew the object of God's kindness? God had covenant with him, right? God gave them religion. They were under the law. God gave them religion. And because God gave them religion, God said, these were my people, right? Okay. See, 
guilty. You must read the Bible forensically. It has to be a crime scene. It has to be, you have to look at that, you have to read that thing and look down on top of it so you can see and maneuver through it. What is he saying? Who is it talking to? Because if you try to read it like a novel, you're going to miss so much. Just slow down, read three verses for three weeks. Check this out. Before I came to church today, I was reading this book on hermeneutics. I'm taking a class on hermeneutics. So I'm reading the book, and it, it, it gave an example of this boy said that he wanted to study zoology. He went to this professor, and the professor said, okay, I'm going to give you this fish that's in this jar. So he gives the boy the fish in the jar. He says, now I want you to examine this fish and tell me everything about it. He said, the, he said the professor left for like five hours. He said he couldn't look at the fish no longer. He looked at it this side, that side, front, back side. He looked at the eyes. He looked at the scales. He tried to count every scale. He looked at it every way. The professor comes back after about five or six hours, and he says, what? So he runs the gambit on the fish. He says, man, you missed it. He said, look at it again. So the professor leaves again. For about three weeks, the professor does this. And every time he comes back, he says, did you see something different this time? And every time the guy, because the guy was forced to look at one thing and study one thing and only study one thing. And until he gained complete understanding of the one thing that he, that he knew, he could not move on. A dead fish in some embalming fluid or whatever it is. And that's how you got to read the word. you got to know what you know what you know about the word and eat right there until, until you're full on that thing and you gain all the revelation you can out of it and then move on. Because, because you can read a whole chapter and get no understanding. It's not doing you any good. But if you read Jesus wept and know why Jesus wept, because of compassion, because of he loved Lazarus, because, because it... it Jesus wept. Two words. Shortest. But, but, but what can you get out of that? You go before. You go after. You think about why Jesus would have so much compassion for a dead man. You'll, you put yourself in the scene. You put yourself in the grave. You think about your friendship with Jesus. That was Lazarus was his boy. You sit there. good stuff. The verb translated think, which comes first in the Greek, is quite Pauline. It's, it's Paul style. It is properly an arithmetic, say that word for me. Arithmetical, which is uh, counted up, right? Yes. To count, mm -hmm. to reckon. But it's often used metaphorically where numbers are not in question with the meaning like to take into account, reckon, consider, it is a word that invites to reasoning, which may be why it turns up so often in Romans. It is suited to the argument of style that Paul adopts throughout this stuff. So let's look at this word to think. Romans chapter 2. And think of thou this. So he's saying, he's saying, he's saying, and I think of thou this. He said, did you take into account? Have you reckoned or have you considered? You're going to, that you're going to escape? That you're going to get away with this? You think because of your covenant. Because of your covenant. So, this is really good. That's I'm glad you answered that. So, why do we get coupled into the, some of the same things and we escape because of our covenant? This is where your theology got to come into play. What you know about Jesus, come on now, what, what you've already learned about Jesus is the answer. Come on. You got, you got the floor. What you already know about Jesus, I want you to think, what you already know about Jesus, why if this person, this Jew, is backbiting, that he doesn't escape the judgment of God, but me as a Christian, I escape the judgment of God even though I'm backbiting. Huh? Come on, big. Huh? I'm under grace. Under grace. You whispered it. 
unsure. tells me a lot of what she knows. The statement tells me exactly what she knows, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to bypass him, saying, because of my covenant. You see, for her to make that statement saying, I don't need Jesus, means that she believes that he's the Messiah, mm -hmm. which the other Jews don't. statement says that he's Messiah in your mind. See that? See, see you gotta you gotta take people's folly and show them light. You gotta take it, it's like it's like a wrestler, right? It's like it's like it's like someone bigger than me running at me and I use his force against me. Right. I use his force against him and by me using his force against him it's like I take his inertia and I flip him over and use it against him. The answer to the question in Romans 2, 3, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Would have to be what? Would have to be what? See, see, look. Come on, read, read it. Would have to be, <laughs> come on. Would have to be what? Okay. That God judges fairly leads to necessarily to the, the, to the conclusion that those who do what they condemn and others must receive the same penalty. Okay, okay, okay. Come on, let's sit down right here. Because I know y'all still confused. Because I'm hearing that it's like non-believers do what they want to do. And they're, they're just doing their thing. But believers do the same thing chapter 2. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? This is only chapter 2. And because it's only chapter 2, you got to ride with me. Okay. You got to ride through this book with me. Because if you ride through this book with me, because, because when I started writing this paper, I'm right where you at. I'm thinking my theology was no better than your theology right, right now. You see what I mean? And, and, and it wasn't until I got to Romans chapter 6, which is our, our foundational chapter. That's why this church... New life. That's why I said, I called my professor when I got to chapter 6, and I said, wait a minute. Romans 6 tells me I'm free from sin. I'm confused. Please explain. And he explained. And I'm not going to give you the, I'm not going to give you the baby. He's a labor pain. Sunday, I said propitiation, expiation, to remove, this, to remove sin or the guilt of sin. Remember that word? Propitiation. I said that he was an eraser. He is the atonement. That he's constantly covering our issues. He gives us justification of life. Romans 5, once we get there, it'll talk about justification of life. How he had to justify the whole thing. How he had to justify every moment of our life. Because if he didn't justify every moment of our life, there was going to be somewhere we messed it up. There's going to be somewhere where we fall short. And because we fall short somewhere, he has to come. Right. See, and this is, where, this is where now religion is being removed and theology is being replaced. Religion was never given to a Gentile. Grace was. The covenant of religion was given to the Jew. The covenant of religion is given to the Muslim. 
They have rules. We have relationship. All they have is a prophet, right? All the Jew has are prophets and a law. We have Jesus who says, one eye, one dot, one tittle will not be removed to this promised law until it's fulfilled. Who fulfills it? He did. So, when the Bible says, thou shalt not steal, and you steal, should you go to hell? Hold on. Who? No, I don't think you should go to hell, but you need to be held responsible or accountable for that. He's not deceived. Right? God is not about that. <coughs> Whatsoever man so that too shall he ask so refuse you a thief. Mm -hmm. you, I, you lose my trust. Mm -hmm. You sow a jail cell, mm -hmm. and then you're going to say, Jesus, why? Maybe not you. <laughs> Conviction. Now, okay, okay, we're going to get here too. One man eats meat, another man eats grass. Is the man who eats meat any worse than the man who eats grass? Does Christian liberty, man, this is dangerous. Christian liberty is dangerous. Because the baby who learns about Christian liberty says, oh, I can go do whatever I want to do. I, oh, yeah. <laughs> I can go do whatever I want to do. It's on and popping now. No, it's not. Because the Holy Spirit's going to show up and say, hey, 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 we don't act this way. And he's coming to lead you. You, you expect a baby to keep crawling up on the kitchen table and eating uh, uh, butter. <laughs> it was icing to me. When they're making a the cake and they give you the bowl, it was kind of like the same texture to me. So, you know, to me it was all the same. And see, and see, and this is where the sermon comes in. Because a lot of times the baby in Christ is trying to, trying to figure out which way to go. And one minute you give me cake batter, but then the next minute you tell me I can't have butter. And not until, okay, for instance, when, when, I, when I first got saved, my wife comes through the kitchen with four little wine coolers, just starting to go to church. Dick, she was drinking when we was going to church, Dick. Yeah. yeah. Tell on it now. She comes through the kitchen. I'm sitting at the table. I went to reach. It was peach. I remember. Yeah, I went, I'm sitting down, and I went to reach up, and as I moved, I heard Holy Spirit say, they're for her and not you. Yeah. Okay. I yielded. Yeah. Okay. I, like that. Yeah. I yielded. She didn't hear what I heard. My cousin, for instance, we had been going to church. I got baptized. I went home and smoked some weed. We are going to church. I'm smoking weed. One night my cousin comes home, he's coming to come get me. Holy Spirit says to him, leave him alone. Yes. Yes, he I said, cuz, what's up, you got something? He said, no, nah. <laughs> <laughs> nothing for you. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. Because, because, because Christian liberty is, is now, now, now my cousin has matured to the place, or I've been broken to the place, to where now he doesn't smoke any more weed. Some of us mature to the place, and others of us get broken into the place. A, the sanctification is going to take its perfect walk. Sanctification, you're going, to, you're going to go through sanctification, whether or not, okay, sanctification, sanctification means to be set apart, right? But ceremonial sanctification, this, this is set apart for me to teach from. Right? A ceremonial sanctification. Progressive sanctification means that I move from faith to faith, from glory to glory, and from faith to faith. That I'm going to start maturing some things. Right? So, so sanctification is going to take its place. So if you find yourself at the beginning of your walk and you 
starting to read the Bible, and you start saying, well, I'm talking about people. I'm backbiting. I'm proud. I don't listen to my mother. There's going to come a time as you walk this thing out in Christ Jesus, and that's why we have justification. That's why he justified our lives. Because we can be in Christ 10 years and still be talking about somebody. Because that's our weakness. It's a character flaw. And Jesus knows the character flaws of man. And so because he knows the character flaws. But see, the person who keeps rejecting Christ and stays out. <coughs> do you think you escape God's judgment? It have to be no. Okay. You got some understanding? Or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, knowing that, not knowing that, the goodness of God leads thee to repentance? Question one. Or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? See this King James. What it should say in English, not old English. Don't you know that the goodness of God leads to repentance? You see, King James in his old English says, not knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance. Huh? That's an old English. When there's a question mark, you've got to go back and rephrase it. Go back and rephrase it. Because that sounds like a statement more than a question. Can I read that? Come on. God. Is this the book? Y'all got the book? This is the book, right? Is this the book part? I got, I got, I got, I got like a couple books in my presentation. This is it. Why are you printing? You got a device? We see God dealing with the accursed folly of the deceitful heart of man who dreams that by merely judging others, though he practices the same things, he shall escape, the, escape God's judgment. See, now, I've reorganized some things for you up to this point. This is not talking about you. I don't want you to think that ever again. This is not talking about you. We see God dealing with the accursed folly of the deceitful heart of man who dreams that by merely judging others, though he practice the same things, he shall escape God's judgment. Check this out. I'm outside of Jesus. Right? I still, none of you know it. You still, we all know it. He's a thief. Oh, none of y'all trust him. He's a thief. We're both sinners. We're both outside of Christ. All of you know that he steals, but you don't know what I do. And because I put myself up here and you don't know it, and we all looking at him as the thief, while y'all watching him, I'm in your stuff. I'm down here in your stuff because you watching him. Woo! Mirrors. No. Smoking mirrors. <laughs> he said play. <laughs> or like like when I get angry, I, I cut sometimes. Mm. I don't need to. Mm. But I, I I'll get blessings and curses. At work, at work the, the people at my job, when they cuss around me, I tell them, uh-uh, I don't want to hear that bad. Okay, okay, okay. That's a good analogy. That just don't apply to you. Now, what's applying right now is Holy Spirit leaning on you right now. Yeah, and I'd be like, Ooh. Now, 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 check this out. Check this out. Check this out. This is good. I'm glad you said that. I'm glad I said what I just said. Because the feeling that we have 
coupled with this stuff is because Holy Spirit's dealing with our, our character flaws. When we do these things and we already know that we shouldn't be doing them, Holy Spirit right now is pulling our coattails. But because we don't know scripture the way we should know scripture, we put ourselves in condemnation. We put ourselves with the accursed. Someone says we hate our own faults when we see them in others. But this state goes beyond even that. For it puts God's it for it puts God right off his throne and makes him connive with a guilty sinner just because, forsooth, this sinner discerns clearly and decries loudly the sins of others while committing the same thing. you an example. Guilty sinner. Sinner. Oh, look it up. Just look it up. Pursuit. Let's look it up. It's your friend. Concerns clearly and the cry loudly, the cries loudly the sins of others. He's the thief. Okay, okay. <coughs> we went to see Planet H last night, right? What's his name? Kabob. He shot Caesar. And then said,
Now, repentance brings about godly sorrow. Right? Now, we always hear some, the preacher say, repent from your sins. He could have this many members in his church. No one knew was here. Everyone saved. And he turns around and tells each and every one of us to repent for the things we did yesterday. Repentance. Not religiously, but theologically, means this that you were facing the world, had your back to Jesus, you turned from the world, and you turned to Jesus. And as you turn to Jesus, now you must go through sanctification to get to the perfection that God has called you to. The moment that you, if this line, if this line is the world, and I turn around and I step into Jesus, physically, almost mentally, nothing has changed. I still think the same way. I still perceive the same way. All those things. It's day one. It's moment one. But I went from natural man to spiritual man in a moment. I don't know how to live like spiritual man yet. I need to learn how to live like spiritual man. So if I'm still backbiting, doesn't necessarily I need to stop, I need to repent, I need to put off. Now that's when the Bible says, take off the old man, be renewed in the mind of your spirit, and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. See, because repentance tells me that I'm still in the world. Theologically. Now, if you want to get it on a personal level, Continue to turn away from the things that hold you from living a Christ-like life. But theologically, repentance is done once. At the moment that you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you've turned from the world and you've turned to Christ. And now, you're chasing after Jesus and you're chasing after this life that he wants you to live. And that's it. You're not expected day one to be where you are in day 100. Yes. The more you apply your life to Christ, the more you chase after Jesus, the more you shed those scales, the more those things start falling off and you start becoming more Christ-like. That's when, that's, when, that's when I see a person go from depression to joy, man. That's when I see that, man. When I see a person come in here and they beat up and bruise some life and life has overtaken them and then knowledge starts coming, more illumination starts coming, more clarity starts coming, more revelation starts coming. And as they start getting all these things, they're starting to able to maneuver the way Jesus wants them to because, because you can be in the state of righteousness and have no information. And because you have no information, you're still living as if you're in the other place, even though you've been released from there and you're living over here. Yes. Paul, Paul. You know, you know what's funny? I was at work yesterday. I had my hard drive at work, right? Because I was making videos and stuff, right? And I watched Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32, when I taught in St. Stephen's the other day. Wow. And I was saying the same things I'm saying right now. I was like, you was probably, you was probably sitting there when I was teaching. Probably. You was probably sitting right there when I was teaching it. Because, 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 man, man, I was getting ready to say something. Pastor, can I say one thing? Come on. on that? It's come full circle for me, and I'm glad to be here for this. I remember the you talk talking about the sanctification process. Like I said, I just came back from Mecca. You know what I mean? That's been 17 years or so. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, it just came down home. Bishop, you know, he just sat me down. We used to go at it. I don't know. Like I said, my daughter's pastor. Her first sermon was from Saul the Paul. She preached about my life. That's what I wanted to say. She preached Thank about you. my life. <laughs> uh, and and uh, I like to share this testimony because my thing was, you know, I was still going through. And a brother kept trying to invite me to church, kept inviting me to church. I'm going to go to church with you guys. You know, it's just my flesh was saying. But the spirit was dealing with me. He was like, go ahead and go. So I'm trying to come up with every excuse, nothing to wear, all the kind of crap. 
but he kept on me. Now, mind you, y'all got to the point we went to blows, because the whole time he was trying to get me to go to the church to hear my child, my firstborn child, give her trial son. So I would grab him the car and all that bitch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no chance in this door. And she got I stood right in the middle and I cried from the moment she first word <coughs> to the last word. And she said, Dad, I'm preaching about you. She said, because you was once soft and now you Paul. And then from that moment, I, I gave my life to Christ. I threw all, anything Islamic had anything to do with it was away. And I still got a bullet in my body because the brothers shot me, tried to kill me because. Muslim ain't supposed to convert to Christianity. I ain't convert to nothing. I accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. Come on. Now. footnotes at the bottom of the book, right? It says, the goodness of God to us, remembered, reflected upon, heartily believed in, moves the heart, and changes the whole attitude toward God. The great preacher of repentance, John the Baptist cried, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what he would say. All of you Jews have been hoping for. Oh, there's Jewy. <laughs> he was stern as was his lord only with religious pretenders who were the religious pretenders Jesus was hard on okay 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 see let's let's establish this stuff man let's establish this stuff because there's religious pretenders in Christianity
Protecting, providing, preserving. God is still holding off wrath. Even when sickness, disease, anger, death is knocking at the door, he keeps holding it off, giving these people chances. God's long suffering. What's long suffering? Is it patience? They're cousins. Oh, at first cousin at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my man, boy. <laughs> okay, so let's look at 922 then, Romans 922. Let's see what 922 says. Oh. It says, what if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. <coughs> fitted. Fitted to destruction. Prepared. Prepared. Oh. Now, 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 fitted. Fitted suit. <laughs> Tailor made. <laughs> Tailor made. Prepared for destruction. Oh. What does that say? L -l Listen, fitted, prepared, tailored for destruction. He's long suffering, but destruction was tailored for them. Okay, okay. What does that say? There's two things it says. Huh? He's getting tired. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Listen, if I go into men's warehouse, put my arm out, measures, measures, inseam, measures, make sure that thing fits me just right, tailor made for me, prepared for me. Prepared. I send my measurements and they cut out. So what does that say? That they were fitted for destruction. So what does that say? It's coming. Huh? Okay, okay. Good word. So what does that say about you? 
that we were what? Predestined. So, at what point were you fitted for it? Ooh, ooh, ooh. If you were predestined to be the elect of God, before he chose you? Received it, yes. We were in, we were tailor made, and we would have kept bucking the election. Oh yes, Lord, she said. <laughs> a distinct need for repentance. There is a distinct need for repentance. So 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 we don't so we don't off off track. Let's read verse four again. Romans two verse four. <laughs> Like study Bible right now, you, it should have told you to go there. If you got it open, it should have told you to go right there. And you'll be right there on your book. In him, we have redemption through his blood. Okay, redemption. What's it mean? Bought. Now, if you're property of him, how can you ever be cashed in? They say like a cell phone where you can sell the cell phone back to the store. He bought you. Okay, so going back to the beginning of Bible, he's not going to sell you out. So going back to the beginning of Bible study, when you find yourself in these categories, if we have redemption through his blood, see, this is where my theology cancels out what I don't understand. What I don't understand, my theology cancels out. If I'm the redeemed of the Lord, if I've been bought by Jesus, if I've been bought by his blood, how can I ever be lined up with the accursed? You can't. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. It doesn't run out. The grace is so wealthy 
that it doesn't run out, which he lavished. Oh, he's rich, and I'm rich in grace too. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose. What's the mystery of his will? No. Start back at end. Come on, let's read it together. Come on, let's read it together. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. What's the mystery? Well, it's right there. We just read it. Listen, what, what's not, see, you know why it's not a mystery? Because it's been revealed to you. His will has been revealed to you, so it's not a mystery. Check this out. The redemption, it's a mystery to the non-believer. It can't be. But because it's been revealed to you, it's no longer a mystery. It's not an enigma because it's been revealed to you. The forgiveness of our trespasses. How can I be so filthy and get to heaven? According to the riches of his grace. I keep messing up, and this stuff just doesn't run out. He just lavished this stuff on me. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us. See, I asked you what the mystery was. He just told you I made it known to you. That's why you have to read the word forensically. I had you read it, and nobody caught it. Making known. Two simple words. See, y'all got redemption, y'all got trespass, forgiveness, grace, lavish, wisdom, insight. The very two little simple words, making known. He revealed. Known. To know, to perceive, <clears throat> insight. Look, look, he even used the word in all wisdom and insight. What's wisdom? What's wisdom? Proper use of knowledge. What knowledge did we gain in this? Redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our trespasses, the riches of his grace. Lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight and in all wisdom and discernment, making known to us the mystery of His will. The mystery of His will. His will is that we saved. And see, it's not a big mystery to us anymore because we know it. So you read mystery and you say in the scripture, there's something I don't know. <laughs> You read the word mystery and you say, okay, there's something I'm missing. He's hiding something from me. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. Okay, okay. So forbearance, tolerance. Here the meaning is that God's kindness and other qualities mentioned are in no short supply. None. Kindness renders a word that is difficult to translate exactly in the Greek, right? The basic thought is that of goodness, the same word is translated good, but it is the goodness that is goodness of heart, not that which is And I don't know what it means. I ain't gonna lie. Come on, Elder Lord, call me out. Austere. Right, what's it mean? Austere is just like bare bones. True, right? That stripped down. Stripped down, correct. No frills. No frills. Okay. <laughs> the translation kindness brings out this benevolent aspect 
but we should not be unmindful of the fact that goodness is also involved. Paul is thinking of God's goodness, which is seen in the kindness he shows to his people. The Jew. Forbearance. That's his kindness.
Compare, compare it. Thank you. Late word, I know what that means. I just can't say it. Late word and one that is rare outside the Bible. The New Testament occurs 14 times, 10 in Paul. Ten uses, Paul used it 10 times. J. Hort says that it takes on a distinctive depth in biblical usage. Uh, renders a word which literally means something like long-tempered as against short-tempered. The difference between me and my wife when it comes to the children. When it comes to my dog. So you don't understand. When she's with me, there's times where she, blah, 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 they get on my nerves, blah, 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 And I say, hey, come up here. They come up in the room, and she, what happened? What happened from me catching all this to me, okay, now, now you put a battery in my back. I'm ready to deal with it. I bring the kid upstairs, and she defends them. I look like the bad guy once again. <laughs> soon as they show up, soon as they show up in the room, it's like she melts. Long tempered. Me? Zero to what? <laughs> See, she ain't being nice in front of y'all, because I always get 60. <laughs> it means patient with people, the ability to bear long in the face of disappointment and opposition. Paul sees God as enduring with patience the continual failure, failure of sinners, and more specifically, sinners from his own people, Israel, to turn away from their sin. The combination with the two preceding nouns gives a wonderful picture of God's refusal to punish and of his goodwill towards people, even sinful people. I was just getting ready to ask you that. What? Because it's like, I've, I've been taught by some, um, sooner or later, he got the devil. I was, uh, I was uh, taught uh, like that, like, uh, sooner or uh, later, because if you keep sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning, mm -hmm. you just, he just like, okay, just go and do, do whatever. That's what, growing He up. will turn you over mm -hmm. to a reprobate mind. He will allow you to do this. Turning you over is saying, oh, that's what you want to do? OK, I'm going to turn you over to it. And there's a recompense of reward for this. See, we just read that. We read that in 1 and 28. It says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Verse 27 says, uh, and likewise, also men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving them in themselves that recompense of their error which was met. That recompense of reward. There's a reward. You do something, you're going to get rewarded for it. You sow, you reap. So, what happens is that if this is what you want to do, God's going to turn you over totally to the lifestyle. And he's going to give you a, huh? He'll stop here. Yes, you will stop hearing, but he doesn't mean he stops speaking. Yeah, I had, to, I, had to, I had to analyze what you just said. See, this, this, is where, this is where you hear him with the reprobate mind. When you're receiving your reward, the recompense of reward, and it gets a little hard, and you get in that lonely place, and you get all alone, and then, and then you call out to God, right? You, nine times out of ten, they still don't hear God, right? And they continue on in the lifestyle. The reason why is because they can't hear him. Not that he didn't speak, 
but they couldn't hear him. Because, because look, look at this, look at this. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, their knowledge tells them to be wise and don't do what goes against God. And because of that, they put a block in their ear and they can't hear. string put in two because we come right back. <laughs> first first word. Nineteen. It says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So did you have an excuse? Thou art inexcusable, old man. Does the Jew have an excuse when Hosea, when, when Isaiah, when uh, 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 Elijah, when... Micah, when, come on, put some of the mother minor prophets. Amen. Amos, when they all just pointed to Jesus. David, 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 under the law, said, Blessed is the man whose sins are not imputed to him. Mm. Under the law, mm. under, under the curse, said, Blessed is the man whose sins are not imputed to him. Could he see Jesus or what? <laughs> to change one's way of life as the result of a complete change of thought and attitude with regard to sin and righteousness. To repent, to change one's way, repentance. <laughs> now. To change one's way of life as a result of a complete change of thought and attitude Guard to sin and righteousness. What if they don't look like it? What if they don't look like it? Yeah. No, 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 Same kind of liquor. One's on the West Coast, one's on the East Coast. It's his doppelganger, right? It's his look-alike. Two parallel places, right? One over here, one over here. They're doing the same exact things. One has a hard heart and one has a soft heart. One has conviction, the other one doesn't have conviction. His character, their characters are messed up, but they both attend church. One's, one's, the attendance of church don't keep them, I'm telling you this. But they both come to church for whatever reason. Periodically or frequently. But they're doing the same thing. God's way in the heart. You can believe that. 
See, because to us, us knowing the baggage on the West Coast and the East Coast, we'll look at them and say, ain't no way they say it. But God knows whether one is penitent or the one is hard-hearted. Reveling in it. Reveling in it, yes. So you can repent. repentance, is, repentance is something that happens in the soul. Mm -hmm. Repentance is not necessarily something that, actions, that, 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 that shows up in actions. Right. Repentance is a soulish thing. It's your mind, your will, your intellect, your imagination, your heart. These things have turned to God. But he, but, but he hasn't surrendered. No, you. Outside. Inside. Inside. You want to see the fruit on the outside. That's the goal. Pistachio, yes. The seed has to grow. You want to see the fruit. But there's a time of planting. There's a time of watering. The seed must die, crack open. Though in English, a focal component of repent is the sorrow or contrition that a person experiences because of sin, the emphasis in the word, in the Greek word, otherwise, seems to be more specifically to the total change, both in thought and behavior, with respect to how one should both think and act. Whether the focus is upon attitude or behavior varies somewhat in different contexts. Luke Three, come on. You, you might not have to change. I got it. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Who's he talking to? The Jew. The, the Jew. He said, bring forth therefore fruits. So, so now he wants to see something. He wants to see something here. Drinking milk. They ain't even they, what? They ain't even drinking nothing. Hebrews 6 1. Therefore, oh, I love this. This is the good one. I, I wish we had time to go through this one. This is a good one. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. You smile like that. It's effective, man. Yeah, because they are around like 6, 7, 8. It says, you know, for some of you, you can't return. Mm -hmm. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Okay. If this is red, correctly, then I've been right all night. <clears throat> because I said repentance theologically means to turn from sin once. Come on. Huh?
little deeper. Okay. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Okay. <clears throat> so that means I got to turn again. Right? What shows why I would have to turn again in this scripture? No, because see, the principles, the principles are of the doctrine of baptism and the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this one we'll do if God permits. He says, we'll leave the principles and go on to these heavier things if God permits. But what in this scripture shows me that repentance has to come again? They lost faith in God. Faith, they lost. There it is. In faith towards God. This is apostasy. Which you would be labeled in Islam. Right. You're an apostate of Islam. He left. He turned his back. If at any time you ever get converted to any other religion, you'll become an apostate of Christianity. That's apostasy to fall away. So if you go from Christianity to Islam, you're in a Christian apostate, converted to Islam. If you go from Islam to Christianity, you're an you're Islamic apostate that had turned to Christ, that had been converted to, to Christ. And in 1st or 2nd Thessalonians, uh, uh, they thought that they missed Christ. And he said, listen, 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 don't worry about it. Not until there's a great falling away and the son of perdition who's already here, takes, takes his throne. Don't you worry about it. Don't worry about it. Eddie Christ's got to come and all that. If he ain't here, you didn't miss it. Showed first unto them of Damascus at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works which meet repentance. Looking for that fruit. Looking for that fruit. What's the first thing that happened though? Huh? Okay, and then what? Turn to God. Turn to God. Then what? Then walk in it. Walk godly. Turn to God. Now then start walking towards him. <clears throat> see, see, if you don't stop at the comma, you don't stop at the punctuation, you say, oh, see, I told you repentance means to do something. I told you, I told you. But if you stop at the comma and just turn to God. But show first unto them of Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout the coast of all Judea, of Judea, and then to the Gentiles. And what about? That they should what? And turn to God. And do works meet for repentance. Start living God. Man, all that for two, two verses tonight? <laughs> That's good stuff. For God we saw a work of repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world work of death. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it brought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, what revenge, in all things you have appreciated.
proved yourselves to be clear of this matter. Okay. That's a lot of stuff there, ain't it? That's a lot of stuff. Okay. Look at this. Amplified. Right? The stress that drives us to God does that. It turns us around. It gets us back in the way of salvation. We never regret that kind of pain. But those who let the stress drive them away from God are full of regrets, end up on a deathbed of regrets. And now, isn't it wonderful all the ways in which the, this distress has goaded you closer to God? You're more alive, more concerned, more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible, looked at from any angle, you've come out of this thing with purity of heart. And that is what I was hoping for in the first place when I wrote the letter. My primary concern was not for the one who did the wrong, or even the one who wronged, but for you, that you would realize and act upon the deep, deep ties between us before God. To act upon not that you became so good, but that you would just turn to him. That you would just turn to him. And next week, we will start at, but after thy hardness and impotent heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath as the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That's where we'll start next week. That's where we'll start next week. And what you have to realize is, it said, the riches of his goodness and the treasure of wrath. There's a, there's, a, there's, there's a correlation there. Some person has the riches of his goodness, and there's another person who has treasured up his wrath. Christ, 
is a total different story. Some of us can't see him because of a lack of knowledge, wisdom, variables of life, not chasing after God, becoming complacent in the things of God, these kind of things. But those who continue to hunger and thirst after righteousness continue to be filled. So if you're at day one of knowledge, my advice to you would be hunger. Feast on this kind of stuff. Because now purpose is being deposited into you. Godly purpose. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. So this just tells me that there's only thing that one thing that he can fill me with. I'm righteous. I can't get more righteous. He can fill me with purpose. Godly divine purpose to do his will in the earth. And his will in the earth is to spread the gospel. Now, listen, all of us are ministers. Maybe not all of us have been called to preach in this kind of capacity, but all of us have been called ministers. So because all of us have been called ministers, that means that we walk worthy of the high calling, right? And we walk worthy of the vocation that has been given unto us. The vocation that has been given unto us is that we are Christ, that we are Christ in the earth, that we are ambassadors, that we are God's people in the earth. The covenant has changed. The veil was ripped from the top to the bottom. We were, the wild olive branch has been grafted in. We won't get there around like Romans 9. The wild olive branch. We were the wild olive branch. You not being Jew, you were a liar, thief, fornicator, outside the covenant of God. You worshiped all kinds of other things. God gives us his son, Jesus. Jesus says, this is the blood of the New Testament, the new contract, the new contract. We have a new contract, which brings us close to God. Jesus, God says that I was in Christ, reconciling the world back unto me. He threw a rope through Jesus. He said, anyone who believes on it will be reconciled, be drawn back to me. I'll send my spirit to come get you and bring you back closer. No matter what I gotta use, no matter what situation I have to use, whether it's good or bad, I'm gonna use whatever it is in the earth that you're going through to bring you back to me. For me, it was three felonies, a jail cell, a gut shot, drug abuse, drug use, drug dealing. That's what it did for me. For others, it was just the lights was out. And I can't take it no more. I gotta pay to live, and I'm tired of paying to live. I need some help, Jesus. I can't figure that life out. For some, it was easier than others. For some, they just they they were born right here. It was right here. Daddy was a preacher. Mommy was deaconess, and she he grew up right here on the lap of mommy and daddy. He was eight. He was nine, he was ten, he cussed a little bit. He cussed a little bit. You know, he cussed a little bit. You know, he tried to drink once. He told a couple lies. And see, and, and he, I'm making light of it, but I envy him. He takes the goodness of God at all times. He stayed in it, grew up in it.